Good morning, everyone. I hope that so far you've had a fantastic morning here at Hunter Hills. My only hope is that it continues to be fantastic as we are now all together and we all now get to worship together. So let's all stand up and begin this morning with our singing. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Sing your praise to the Father, praise to the Father, praise to the Father of glory. Sing your praise to the Father, praise to the Father, praise to the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Lift your hands to the Father, hands to the Father, hands to the Father of glory. Lift your hands to the Father, hands to the Father, hands to the Father of love. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. And we will glorify, we will glorify the Lord. Worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of glory. Let us worship the Father, worship the Father, worship the Father of love. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah. Unto the Lord, sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud to God, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. From the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, let all creation praise His name. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto from the ends of the earth and from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise His name From the ends of the earth From the depths of the sea Let all creation praise His name Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah Shout hallelujah unto the Lord Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. And shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Amen. You can be seated. 
Good morning, Hunter Hills. We are glad you are here. I don't know about y'all, but I love that song because it just brings so much energy to the room. And uh, sometimes we need a little energy boost, don't we? Because we, we just, we've just, got, just gotten up, long night, maybe down, gone to bed, had a good time last night. So just a good shot of energy is, is always a good thing. If you're a guest today, we are so glad that you're here. Thank you for choosing to be a part of our worship time. Stop by the information table on the way out, fill out a card, and we've got a gift for you, uh, for you to take on your journey. Um, but we are thankful that you're here today. It's Father's Day. Try to contain your excitement. Um, but it is, you know, if it's Mother's Day, we probably have everybody stand and give a round of applause. But uh, it's just Father's Day. But it's just, oh, we're glad, uh, good, glad everybody's here. But it is this Father's Day. I don't know, but I, hey, I'm thankful. I'm 61, two years old, and I still have my father. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. A lot of people don't have that. So um, if you still have your, your dad, be thankful. Um, and I'm thankful for those people who played a role in my life as fathers, um, beyond my father. And I'm thankful for those fathers who helped me be a father. There's so many reasons uh, to be thankful today. So we do, we do celebrate Father's Day, and so happy Father's Day to, to all you guys this morning. So let me give you some important things to remember. First, you probably noticed when you came in, all the agape cans out there on the information table. Grab you one of those, take that home and start filling it up. Bring it back, weighing about 20 pounds, so it's full of coins. Um, told somebody this morning, we found one in my top dresser drawer, so we'll probably bring back two this year. Uh, for the one that we didn't bring back last year, uh, plus the one we'll get for this year. So grab your can and fill that thing up and bring it back. Some dates for you to remember, and I know that these are going to be a lot of dates, but I, we, it's important that we try to remember as many as we can. July the 5th, we're going to have a whole church gathering. We did this last year. We'll have a cookout, hopefully do that over at the school, play some games, uh, cornhole tournament like we did last year, some basketball stuff, just a great time to be together, we'll grill out some hamburgers and hot dogs. You just have a great time of fellowship together. That's going to be on Wednesday night, July the 5th. We've been talking a lot about uh, buddies for our special needs ministry. We want to give you some dates about that. So you may be thinking, you know, I've been hearing about this, hearing about this, but I'm just not sure this is for me. I don't know that this is what I need to do. Well, we're going to do some things that are going to help you decide that. So um, we're going to do some buddy training. So let me give you a couple of dates. July the 15th and July the 22nd. Those are Saturdays. And we're going to be doing some buddy training. You see the time is 9 to 1130. If you have some questions about that, you can contact Dean. But if the Saturdays don't work well, there's going to be a Sunday morning class that's going to take place for three weeks, August 13th, 20th, and 27th. And that may be just the thing you need to tip you in the direction of being a buddy. So uh, look at those dates and uh, see if which ones work best for you. Remember, the key thing is buddies must be 16 years of age or older. And if you have any questions about that, you can see uh, Dean and he'll, he can answer anything you need to know. Remember Camp Refuge next month, July 23rd to the 28th. Be a great time if you haven't signed up for that and you want your kids to go. Be sure you do that as well. So last thing uh, this morning, uh, before we continue back into our song service, we've got some folks leaving this week for Honduras. Uh, you know, Honduras is one of the ministries that we support uh, each and every year through our Mission Sunday. So uh, I think Alan's leading a team down there this, this uh, coming up week. Ron Carter is going to be involved in that. Uh, so I want to invite those that are going to Honduras, to, and I don't even know who all it is, um, invite them to come to the front, whether they want to or not, which I told, um, told some, be sure you come, regardless. I know Christina is all excited about going to Honduras. Sandy's excited that Christina's going. I'm not sure Nancy's excited that Christina's going, but... Um, you know, the Honda is a really, really important ministry that we do. And I'm going to let, I didn't tell Alan this, but I'm going to let him say two sentences about what we hope to accomplish while you're there. Yeah, so we got a few uh, activities lined up. Uh, we're going to 
we've got some construction projects, some folks that uh, don't have a, a roof on their house. We're going to be putting a roof on some folks' house there. Uh, pouring a concrete floor uh, in one of the houses as well. Um, we'll be visiting the schools where many of you sponsor children there. Uh, so we'll be visiting with those children. Um, we'll be handing out uh, baskets of food to the, uh, the extremely poor folks, people who typically just eat one meal a day. So we give them a basket of provisions. Uh, some folks have been raising money for that. And so we got probably 50 baskets uh, to hand out. But that, among other stuff, that's, that's some of the stuff we'll be doing down there. You know, it's, it's interesting. Those are things we take for granted here. Just food, a roof over your head, a concrete floor. Uh, those are just things that we just expect living in a, a prosperous uh, country like we do. Let's pray this morning as we send these guys off uh, on, their, on their mission. Oh, God, we thank you today for all of the ways that you bless us. We have so, so many reasons to be thankful. And um, we live in a, such a prosperous country, and we have so much. We have way more than we need. And so, Father, I just pray uh, this morning a special blessing on all of those, uh, those from here and from other places who will meet up uh, this week in Honduras. Lord, I pray that you will open doors of opportunity for them, uh, that they will be able to share your love with those that she com they come in contact with. And, Father, I pray for the work that they'll be doing. Um, I pray for their safety as they do this work. Uh, but, Lord, I just pray... Uh, that uh, there will be so much joy that will abound uh, in this effort. And I thank you, Lord, that we can be a part of it. Even though we're not there, we still uh, can be a part of it. And we just ask your blessings upon each and every one of them. And we're going to thank you in advance for what you're going to do uh, through those that will be away from us. Protect them while they travel and bring them back home safely to us. It's through Jesus uh, that we all pray together. Amen. Let's all stand back up and uh, continue in our worship this morning. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not falter, I will not faint. He is my shepherd, I am not afraid. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. He will uphold me all of my days. I am surrounded by mercy and grace. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord will be my strength. I will not waver walking by faith. He will be strong to deliver me safe. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Lord is my strength. He took my burdens all away up to a brighter day. He gave me a song. He gave me a song. A wonderful song. A wonderful song. A wonderful song I now can see. In my heart joy bells ring. He gave me a song. He gave me a song. A wonderful song. A wonderful song. He gave me a song. He gave me a song. To sing about. To sing about. He lifted me. He lifted me. From sin and doubt, oh praise His name! Oh praise His name! He is my King! He is my King! 
a wonderful song. A wonderful song he is to me. He is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song. He gave me a song. A wonderful song. A wonderful song. And some of these days in that fair land, sing with a chorus grand. He gave me a song. He gave me a song. A wonderful song. A wonderful song. He gave me a song. He gave me a song to sing about. To sing about. He lifted me. He lifted me. From sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. Oh, praise his name. He is my king. He is my king. A wonderful song. A wonderful song. He is to me. So earlier this week, um, I guess last week, uh, I was asked to do communion. And when I asked what the theme for today was, uh, I found out it was joy. Um, and so I've been thinking about joy ever since. <laughs> and I don't want to stand up here and steal uh, Will's thunder because all the different thoughts and ideas that I've had, I, I feel like I could stand up here and preach a sermon today and, and probably next Sunday um, two. But what was so cool about that, you see, <clears throat> is I really needed that because there's been some things going on uh, the past couple of weeks that have they've made me mad. Um, they've made me sad. I've been disappointed. Um, there's been things that's caused a lot of stress um, and anxiety. And I let all those things rob my joy. Um, so it's just so funny how God works. Because it wasn't a coincidence um, when Jerry texted me and asked me if I could lead the thoughts this morning. Because God knew that's what I needed. I needed that reflection. So some of you may not <clears throat> know this about me, and you sure can't look at me now and, and tell it. Um, but back in the day, I used to play a little ball. My body doesn't allow it now, but I still enjoy watching it. And most recently, um, it was the Women's College World Series. And, and the Alabama girls had made it, and we were watching them. They got put out very fast. And Oklahoma went on to win it all. And in fact, they've won the last three years in a row. And this season, they only lost one game. They went 61 and 1 this season. Uh, that's impressive. So understand this, I'm not an OU fan. But I do have a, an appreciation for good coaching and good athletes. And so you may be wondering how this relates to communion. So, so bear with me because what I'm about to share with you really made an impact uh, with me a few weeks ago. And it's what the girls said after the championship game in their post-game interview so a reporter from ESPN asked him, said, I want to talk to you about keeping the joy of the game alive. He said, it's a long season. You guys have a target on your back the entire time with your win streak and with being number one. How do you handle the unique pressure that comes with that? How do you keep the joy for so long when it seems like anxiety could easily set in? So one of the players, Grace Lines, <clears throat> she responded with this. The only way that you can have joy that doesn't fade away is from the Lord. And any other type of joy is actually happiness that comes from circumstances and outcomes. Joy from the Lord is the only thing that can keep you motivated and in a good mindset, no matter the outcome. Joy from the Lord is really the only answer to this because there is no way softball can bring you that because of how much failure comes with it because of the roller coaster of emotions this game can be. Sitting next to her was one of her teammates, Jada. And Jada said, I 1000% agree with Grace. I went through that my freshman year. I was so happy to win the World Series, but I didn't feel joy. I didn't know what to do the next day. I didn't know what to do the next week. 
I didn't feel filled. And I had to find Christ. That is what makes our team strong. We're not afraid to lose because it's not the end of the world because our lives are in Christ and that's all that matters. Sitting next to her was a girl named Alyssa. And Alyssa says, a huge thing that we've latched onto this season is eyes up. And she said, you'll see us point up, look up, and she said, because what we're doing is fixing our eyes on Christ. We know this game is giving us the opportunity to glorify God. Once we figured that out, and that was our purpose, and everyone was all in with that, it changed us. It's awesome to play for something bigger, and that's what brings me so much joy. No matter the outcome, whether we get a trophy in the end or not, this is in our home, and that's what is so amazing. We have an eternity of joy with our Father, and my sisters in Christ will be there with me. Wow. Wow. The answer those girls gave, <clears throat> it's just it's resonated with me. And that's why we're here this morning. We're here to celebrate the joy of that eternity with our brothers and sisters, with our family. Because of that promise and because of what Jesus did. And I think it's fitting with it being Father's Day. <laughs> our Father gave us the most amazing gift that anyone could give us, which was His Son. And so when Kim and I were talking about joy, you know, Kayla and I talked about it, Kayla was, Kayla was the joy of being a new mom. Kim was the joy of family. I reflected on just being a father, being a new grandfather. But Kim said, do you think God experiences the same joy when his children gather around the table that we experience when our children gather around the table thought that was a pretty, pretty deep thought. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for being our Father. Words don't adequately, uh, adequately express um, our thankfulness. And we so look forward to that eternal joy, God. God, and just help us, help us to choose joy in our everyday lives because we know how the game ends. We're, we're all winners, God. And so this morning, as bread and wine nourishes our body, this bread and this wine that we take, it nourishes our soul. And God, we thank you for that. And God, we just love you. And we thank you so much for Jesus. And we pray all this in his name. Amen. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Desire and I long to 
and learning that is for our three-year-old kids through kindergarten eight. I got it right this time. You did. I didn't, and I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't have to look at the screen. You didn't read it's it? Been up, it's been up there for as long as I can remember. I just always forget what ages, but three-year-old kids through kindergarten age kids, like we have something just for you. So if you want to go out that back door, there should be somebody there with a smile on their face to greet you. Good morning, Hunter Hills family. Welcome to all of you who are visiting with us. We're so glad that you're here. This morning, we are continuing our sermon series called Kingdom People. Uh, we're looking at four virtues of people who belong to the kingdom of heaven. Starting in July, I want to make you aware, we're going to be doing a series called Ordinary Gathering, where we're going to be talking about what we do here. What do we do when we gather together as a church? Um, what is it? Why? Why? And I think that's going to be a very encouraging series to us, um, specifically for some things we're going to be talking about this morning. This gathering is for us to use. It's for us to use for our joy. And I think uh, David did a great job drawing attention to how communion specifically can be used by us for our joy. So uh, plan to be here for that. The big idea of this series is really, as it's unfolded, I've realized it's just a prolonged reflection on Philippians 3, where Paul says, all who are in Christ are citizens of heaven. Now take that, and what one of the first things that, that uh, should pop out at you is that if we are citizens of heaven who live on earth, then we are aliens. We are sojourners. We are foreigners here. And then the next question, I think, uh, is why did God do this in such a way where we live in this land while being citizens of that land? And I think the answer is obvious, because there's a purpose in it. God doesn't do things without a purpose. There's a purpose in him rescuing us out of this world and yet leaving us in this world. And I think the purpose is the way Jesus puts it, that we would shine the light in this world, and that as people see our good works, they will give glory to God who is in heaven. In other words, we are to represent heaven on earth. If you've ever traveled internationally, I know Mary just got back from Italy, I don't know if she had this experience, but if you've ever travel, traveled internationally, it's uncanny how non-Americans often can tell that you're an American even before they hear you talk. 
and I don't remember where we were, but me and Brittany were talking about this the other day. Uh, we asked somebody somewhere, how can you tell? And they said, it's your shoes. It's American shoes. We can see it a mile away. And I don't know if, if that's true now, uh, but you know, some people can tell, they say they can tell you're an American because of the way that you walk. Some say that um, the way Americans walk, it, we take up more space. I don't know if, what that means. We walk, we swing, our, I don't know what it means. But they say they can tell. Some say they can tell you're an American because you hold your head up high, you scan the horizon, you're not afraid to make eye contact with people. Whatever it is, I think that God has a similar intention for his people on earth. And that is, quickly, that he would rescue, by the power of the preaching of the gospel, he would rescue people out of this world to become citizens of heaven, to then plant heaven inside of them. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit who comes to make things holy, things that are on earth, he makes them heavenly. And then those people walk on this earth in such a way where it's obvious where we come from. Our citizenship is obvious just from the way that we walk. And then people in this world see that. They give glory to our God who is in heaven. And then heaven comes to them. And then they become citizens of heaven. And I think this is God's plan. That's why Jesus says, when your light shines, they will give glory to God who is in heaven. If you look like heaven you look like God. If you look like God, you look like heaven. And they will glorify him, and they will live in heaven as well. I wonder if that is your vision of what all of this is. I wonder if that's, that's your understanding of what's going on. I think that is the Bible's vision of what it means to be a Christian. And I hope it is your vision as well. This is huge. It's always much bigger than you think. That brings us to our topic today. Those who are to walk in the heavenly way are to be people of joy. And so this morning we're going to be talking about heavenly joy. Of the four virtues, you know, we've discussed two already, then today and then next week Max is going to be presenting the virtue of peace. Of all the four, this is the one that I needed to meditate on the most. And I hope that my reflections that, that have been good for me, as David said they were good for him. I hope that they're helpful to you as well. I needed to meditate on this because ever since I was a teenager, I was, and I knew that I was, uh, a kind of a moody, grumpy individual. We, we all have, why are you laughing? I'm supposed to be hiding that. You're not supposed to know that that quickly. Um, we all have, when we're not at our best, we lean towards some predisposition, don't we? Uh, you know, some have just their default is anger, and when things aren't well, they just sort of lean toward that disposition. Um, when things aren't well, some people lean into this kind of frenzied anxiety, never, never still, never at peace. And then some of us, I think, when things aren't well, we lean toward this grumpiness, this moodiness, this negativity. If you don't know whether or not you're a grumpy person, uh, then see if this description fits. And if after hearing this, you still don't know if you're a grumpy person, there's an easy test, all right? Whoever you live with, ask them, am I a moody, grumpy person? And they will tell you, uh, hopefully they will tell you the truth. Grumpy people are most of the time just frowning, scowling. Not everybody who frowns is a grumpy person. Some people have resting grump face. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, but grumpy people tend to, they show it on their face. Grumpy people in conversation quickly bring it into a negative direction. Something in this world is not right. That's what I want to talk about. And if you're talking about something positive, grumpy people have this incredible talent to remind you it's not as positive as it could be. It could be better. Grumpy people are often irritable because when you're grumpy, even the smallest inconveniences just irritate you. And then lastly, moody people are prone to be inconsistent. One day they're your best friend. The next day, act like they don't even know you. They're not consistent. 
After hearing that, would anybody be so bold as to join me in an admission that you're kind of a grumpy person? It's just me. Oh, I got a few hands. Thank you. Thank you, brave souls. My wife says I'm grumpy. Then it's true, brother. It's true. You need no introspection. It's true. Well, what's wrong with this? You know, I understand that angry people need help. I get that. You know, because anger can hurt feelings and destroy relationships. I understand why they need to work on meekness. I get that. I understand why fearful people need help. You know, some people are so afraid of the future and the unknowns, they can't even seem to get up off the couch to do what they know they need to do. I know they need to work on courage. But what's wrong with grumpiness? It's different. All right? Isn't it? No, but grumpy people think it is. It's different because you can't control your moods. You can't control how you feel. Sometimes you're just down. Sometimes you're just blue. And if I can't control my mood, then does that mean living a life of joy is just pretending to be happy? Why should I have to hide that I'm grumpy? Why should I have to pretend to be happy when I'm not? Before we dig into that, I just want to make a few caveats. I'm not talking about the occasional bad day. We're human. We have an occasional bad day. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, And I'm not talking about those times in life where you go through something truly terrible. No one expects you to put on a happy face. Everybody understands that your joy is, is much harder to come by in this season. And I'm also not talking about what we might call clinical depression. And I, I'm not talking about that because uh, many struggle with this deep sadness and they have done work. They have worked and they've worked consistently and hard and still the sadness will not lift from them. I'm not talking about that. Um, though, those types of things, we would refer you to counselors, we would refer you to professionals who, um, who can test out different medications and things like that to regulate that. However, if you think you have what we're calling clinical depression, but you haven't really done the work that we're going to talk about today, the work is a good thing to do. Um, it's, it's not going to hurt you. It might help you. And I think even if you are clinically depressed, even if you take medication for this, there is still help to be gained from the things that we're going to be talking about this morning. But for the most part, I'm just sort of talking about these habitually grumpy people of whom I am a recovering grump. So the question still stands, why should we have to hide our ongoing, consistent grumpiness from people? Why should we have to put on a happy face? Some offer the advice, fake it till you make it. Pretend to be happy, and then eventually that mood will pass. And I think there's some wisdom in this advice, but I think the Bible's wisdom far surpasses that. And that's what I want to look at this morning. The Bible's answer to this ongoing, consistent moodiness is rejoice. That does not sound like much of an answer, does it? The Bible doesn't seem to like the question, why should I pretend? I don't think the Bible would have us pretend. I think the Bible would just have us to be joyful. The Bible does not treat grumpiness or moodiness or consistent negativity as something that has power over us. And all we can do then is to vent our grumpiness to the world or pretend to be happy. That's not the treatment. The Bible commands that Christians live a life of rejoicing. Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Some of you might have never read this verse as a command. Some of you might have never read this verse as pointing to a Christian obligation to be happy. But let's keep reading. Verse 5. 
Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Is gentleness an obligation for the follower of Christ? I'd say it is. And it follows right on the, the, the tail of the rejoice command. Is gentleness an obligation and rejoicing not an obligation? That, that would be a tough case to make. Verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. Are we obligated as kingdom people to fight our anxieties? I'd say so. Are we obligated as Christian people to do it with thanksgiving? I'd say so. What about verses 8 and 9? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Is Paul here laying out our Christian duty to think on these things? And then he closes this whole section by making it very clear what you have learned practice these things that's how he ends this little section how does he begin the section rejoice in the lord always how can god command a feeling how can he command a feeling Aren't we not in control of the feeling of happiness, the feeling of joy? This is not isolated to Philippians, the so-called epistle of joy. Uh, Paul says the same thing in Romans 12, 12. He says, rejoice in hope. Same tone, command, imperative, do it. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. And then one of the last things Paul ever tells the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 13, 11, finally, brothers, rejoice. One of our problems is that we have only considered, we've only considered rejoicing and happiness to be spontaneous, natural things. And we have not wrestled with the fact that it is a command. Well, how can God command a feeling? I know he can command a behavior. If he wanted to, he could say, fake it till you make it. But how is it that he can command a feeling? Let's think about it this way. What did we expect would be the result of the gospel? Did we expect that God would send his son to die for our sins, to rise from the dead, to conquer all the great enemies of, of humanity, sin, Satan, and death, and the world, and then to just be okay if people who say they believe these things go on being sad. That doesn't make any sense. Is it not for our joy that he did all the things that he did? Isn't the hope that we know about because of this gospel, isn't this intended to make us joyful? And what about this? Isn't God joyful? Isn't heaven overflowing with joy? Look at Zephaniah 3. The prophet here is talking to a people who have suffered the judgment for their sin. And they're down, they're sad, they're depressed. But the prophet is promising that there will come a day of restoration and a day of salvation. And church, what was to them a future thing is to us a present reality. We are the recipients of this promise. And so what we're about to read, it applies to us just as much as it applies to people back in Zephaniah's day. And Zephaniah writes this, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, we are the daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, we are the, the Gentiles grafted onto the branch of Israel. Rejoice and exult, be glad, delight with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Notice the command for us to rejoice. 
Why? Verse 15, because the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We have had the judgment lifted off of us. He has cleared away your enemies. Yes, he has. Satan, sin, death, the world. He's defeated them or given us a sure promise of their defeat. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. He certainly is. Christ came to be God with us. He sent the Spirit to be God within us. You shall never again fear evil. Yes, he has called us to a life of courage and not fear. These are really great reasons for us to rejoice, but he goes on. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will rejoice over you in delight. He will quiet you by his love, and he will exult. He will delight. He will rejoice over you with loud singing. Not only is our calling to rejoice in this salvation, God rejoices in this salvation. Remember what uh, Jesus said at the end of each of the parables in Luke 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. After the sheep was found, what does he say? There will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What about the lost coin? Jesus says, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then when the lost son returns, Jesus doesn't say anything about the joy of heaven or about the joy of angels because it's so obvious that the father in this parable is God himself. And what does the father say to the older brother? He says it was fitting. It was appropriate. What else could we do but celebrate and rejoice for this your brother was dead and is alive he was lost and is found God joyfully saves to bring joy to the saved all this and we don't even have time to discuss the mystery which is the joy of God in himself before creation from all eternity past but to this point, I'll quote this Psalm of David. In Psalm 16, David writes, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Suffice it to say, God is a God of joy. And heaven is full of rejoicing always. So that helps us answer our question, how can the Bible command us to rejoice? Remember where we began. What is the life of a Christian? What is the calling to which we've been called? It is to be a living, walking, breathing demonstration of the life of heaven on earth. And brothers and sisters, if the life of heaven is just joy upon joy upon joy... It makes perfect sense why God would command that these heavenly citizens embrace joy to its full, to be joyful, happy people. And so what are we to make of the person who claims to be a citizen of heaven, who claims to believe this great gospel, but goes on walking consistently in sadness? Well, we as Christians, we know, apart from medical things going on, apart from those circumstances, we know that there's something defective in the citizen of heaven who refuses to live with joy. But what about the people who don't belong to the kingdom of heaven? What are they to make of this? Aren't they justified in thinking, Maybe there's something defective about heaven. And so God 
puts the joy of heaven into our hearts, yes. But you and I are weak. You and I are forgetful. You and I are up and down. You and I have swinging moods. And so for the building up of the church and for the salvation of the world and for the glory of God, he lays it down as a command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Because, church, our joy is not just to be enjoyed by us alone. Our joy is to be enjoyed by the church. Our joy is to be enjoyed by the world as citizens of heaven. Again, I'm not saying we can't ever have a bad day, and I'm not saying we have to pretend we're happy when we're not. And I'm not saying that there aren't situations that are medically very serious, and a lot of what I'm saying does not apply to that. I'm not saying any of that. I think you are with me. I am saying that barring any major medical issue going on, we are called to be genuinely and evidently joyful. Evidently means to be seen. People, it's evident to them. And it is to be genuine. And so that leads us to one final issue. If rejoicing is our duty as Christians, how can we do it? How, how can we do it? If you've ever felt like a slave to one of your moods, you know what I'm talking about. How can we overcome it? How can we do what we're supposed to do. And the first thing I want to say is that our moods and our feelings are more under our control than we think they are. It is true that most of the time, we cannot, as a matter of sheer willpower, change a mood on a dime. That's true. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do about it. That doesn't mean there isn't work to be done to enhance our joy and to bring joy into our lives. There is work to be done. Remember the passage in Philippians 2, work out your own salvation. We can apply that here. If God has come to save us from sadness and despair, he cannot save us from sadness and despair if we go on being sad. You see what I'm saying? It hasn't happened. There is no salvation from sadness if we go on being sad. And so he is working within us to save us from sadness. And Paul is saying, I think we can apply it here, you work out that same salvation. You work. Put work into becoming free of sadness. There is work we can do for our joy. And I want to suggest two ways that we can work. And again, if, if there's something something like a clinical depression that you're going through, this still is going to help you. Is it going to solve your problem? Is it the only thing you need? No. There's lots of, lots of professionals who can help with these things, and often we need that. But these things will still help, and I want to suggest two ways that have been extremely helpful to me as I have struggled with moodiness uh, and realized for me, because it is not clinical yet, it might be one day, but because it is not right now, for me, my grumpiness is really just laziness. It is lazy. I'm being lazy about doing the work of being happy. I can't sit around and complain of all, of all the negative things in my life and, oh, I'm so grumpy. If I haven't done anything to try to be happy, in the Lord. And so there, there are two ways that have been helpful to me. And the, the first way I want to bring to your attention is to talk to yourself. There uh, was a preacher who preached in London in the middle of the 20th century named Martin Lloyd Jones, and I believe he died in 1981. He preached a series on spiritual depression. And one of those sermons was an extended reflection on Psalm 42. And if you'll remember Psalm 42, the psalmist there is extremely down, extremely sad. He says, tears have been my food day and night. And they keep saying to me, where is your God? Very, very sad. 
And somewhere in that psalm, the psalmist says, why are you downcast, O my soul? And Martin Lloyd-Jones picks up on this and says this, and I'm going to quote it at length because I think this will be helpful. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they are talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday, etc. Somebody is talking. Who is talking to you? Yourself is talking to you. Now, this man's treatment in Psalm 42, he means the psalmist's treatment of this was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why are you downcast, O my soul? He asks. His soul has been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, Self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. One of the things we can do to work on our joy is when the mood is coming on, when the negativity is setting in, we can stop what we're doing as soon as possible and go have a little chat with ourselves. And the first thing we can do is examine the mood. Why, ha why did this come on? I don't know about you or my other moody brothers or sisters. A lot of times... I feel bad before I know why I feel bad. And I have to get off somewhere and I have to ask, why are you downcast, oh my soul? Tell me, what is actually going on? And when you're having this examination, you can start to talk to yourself. You can remind yourself of those basic truths that have always brought Christian people joy, that God is near to you, that God, everything is well between you and God. Unless, of course, it isn't, and then guess what? You have an opportunity to repent of your sin. You have an opportunity to get right. Remind yourself, no matter what's going on, and I say remind yourself, I, I, don't, mean, I don't mean just like mentally. I, I mean deep in your soul, remind yourself, and don't let up until your soul gets it. Remind yourself, no matter what's going on, all of this is going to end with our ultimate joy in the presence of God. Where there is not just a little bit of joy, there is the fullness of joy. Where there's not just a little bit of pleasure for a little while, but pleasures forevermore. That's how all of this ends for the child of God. Remind yourself also that you have a mission to be a living demonstration of heaven on earth to tell the world by the way you live and the things you say what god is like and i'll say brothers and sisters the more you feed yourself with the word of god the more you come and gather with the church and relentlessly engage every moment for your joy when you show up and you say i'm going to squeeze this hour and a half for every bit of joy that it has for me and I'm going to give every bit of joy I have for somebody else. When you do that, when you go off to the side to talk to yourself, you're going to have a lot of good things to say. One of the problems when we are spiritually young or spiritually mature, we don't talk to ourselves real good. We say some, some dumb things to ourselves, don't we? And that's simply because not enough truth has come in for those conversations to be very fruitful. But keep growing, keep taking it in, and you'll be able to say some really good things to yourself. The second way we can work on our joy is uh, to begin our day with God. And for this, I was greatly helped by a man who lived in the 19th century named George Muller. He was a man renowned for his prayer life and his uh, incredible philanthropy. And in 1841, he wrote this down in his journal and it is a very lengthy quote, okay? But I think we need to hear this because he's like an older brother in the faith. He's like a wise older brother who's got some words of wisdom for us, and I think we'll all be benefited by it. Let's read this long quote, and then we'll be done. I saw more clearly than ever 
that the first great and primary business to which I ought to attend every day was to have my soul happy in the Lord. The first thing to be concerned about was not how much I might serve the Lord, how much I might glorify the Lord, but how I might get my soul into a happy state and how my inner man might be nourished. For I might seek to set the truth before the unconverted. I might seek to benefit believers. I might seek to relieve the distressed. I might in other ways seek to behave myself as it becomes a child of God in this world and yet not be happy in the Lord and not being nourished and strengthened in my inner man day by day, all this might not be attended to in the right spirit. Before this time, my practice had been, at least for 10 years previously, as an habitual thing, to give myself to prayer after having dressed in the morning. Now I saw that the most important thing I had to do was to give myself to the reading of the Word of God and to meditation on it. And thus my heart might be comforted, encouraged, warned, reproved, instructed. And that thus, whilst meditating, my heart might be brought into experimental communion with the Lord. I think he means experiential communion with the Lord. Not just head knowledge, but in your whole soul, your whole heart, you, you know what this means to commune with the Lord. I began, therefore, to meditate on the New Testament from the beginning, early in the morning. The first thing I did after having asked in a few words, the Lord's blessing upon his precious word, was to begin to meditate on the word of God, searching, as it were, into every verse to get blessing out of it. You see how he's using it. <laughs> it sounds so bad to say we use it, but that's exactly what we do, because that's exactly why it's been given to us. We use it for blessing. We use it for our joy. The gathering, the church service, the scriptures, the songs, our relationships, I'm not saying we're selfish and we never give. I'm saying we are selfless and we give and we use it for our blessing because we know we need it. Where was I? Every verse getting blessing out of it, not for the sake of the public ministry of the word, not for the sake of preaching on what I had meditated upon, but for the sake of obtaining food for my own soul. The result I have found to be almost invariably this, that after a very few minutes, my soul has been led to confession or to thanksgiving or to intercession, prayers for others, or to supplication, asking God for things. So that, so that though I did not, as it were, give myself to prayer but to meditation, yet it turned almost immediately more or less into prayer. Last part. When thus I have been for a while making confession or intercession or supplication or have given thanks, I go on to the next words or verse, turning all as I go on into prayer for myself or others, as the word may lead to it, but still continually keeping before me that food for my own soul is the object of my meditation. The result of this is that there is always a good deal of confession, thanksgiving, supplication, or intercession mingled with my meditation, and that my inner man almost invariably is even sensibly nourished and strengthened, and that by breakfast time, with rare exceptions, I am in a peaceful, if not happy, state of heart. Thus also the Lord is pleased to communicate unto me that which very soon after I have found to become food for other believers. And I think it really comes down to this lyric that can't uh, escape my mind. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, how much needless pain we bear just because we do not take it all to God in prayer. Or we take it to God for five minutes and we're like, you had your chance, God, I'm still grumpy, off to work. The challenge, brothers and sisters, this morning is to leave here resolved to work on our happiness so that we can shine the light of heavenly joy for the building up of the church, for the salvation of the world, and ultimately for the glory of God. The praise team can go ahead and come on up, and we're going to sing a song now that will help us work on our joy. If you will do the work, by which I mean sing it out. If you will do that, the song will have you talk to yourself and remind yourself to bless the Lord
for all the great things that he has done. Let's stand. Let's sing. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship his holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship his holy name. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship his holy name. And on that when my strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come Still my soul will sing your praise unending Ten thousand years and then forevermore Bless the Lord, oh my soul Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship his holy name. I worship your holy name. Couldn't help but think as Will was t uh, challenging us to talk to ourselves which is an interesting idea. Something we could tell ourselves is what we say every week when we leave this room because this encourages us. When we rec If we can't find joy in this text, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We belong to God. We were called out of darkness into light. Let's say this together as we leave today and take this with you this week and you will find joy. We are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who belongs to God, that we may declare praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once we were not a people, but now we're God's people. Once we had not received mercy, but now we have received mercy. You are sent.